You should be all set, sir. Nick, yeah. take it away. I'm coming. Um, is it sharing? Uh, yep. All right. I, see it. I uh, Nolan, when we when we do this, uh, just interrupt me anytime someone has a question because I don't think I see the chat anymore. We'll even do. on my other screen. Um, or just turn on your microphone if you want to say something and stop me, whoever's tuning in. Uh, if this is the first time that you've ever seen me before, I, I'm Nick Raboy. I, I live in Tracy, uh, California here, and I work at MongoDB as a developer advocate. Um, I, I think I did a game development one for you in the past, Nolan. I know I have a recording on my own YouTube channel uh, where we kind of built out the graphical side of things for the game, like uh, animations and physics collisions and things like that. Uh, that's not necessarily going to be the focus of tonight. Tonight is going to be more along uh, the lines of the data side of things in game game development, uh, both very relevant. Um, we're still going to see how to do some basic physics stuff, basic collision stuff. But if you're looking for something pretty like what we saw previously, um, either Nolan probably has a recording of it. I have a recording of it. Um, we can get it in, in the in the chat at some point in time, right, Nolan? Uh, yep. Yeah. If you just go to, we've got one. If you go to YouTube and search um, SAC Interactive or South of Shasta, that's my consulting firm. There's a YouTube playlist up there with all of these videos and Nick's uh, video about Unity Game Dev yeah. is in there. I'll put a yeah, link for the that good in news, the chat for everyone. Perfect. The good news is that you don't need to have prior uh, watched the last session in order to follow along with this one. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna take it fresh. We're gonna come at it from a different angle, and uh, you should be able to piece the two together uh, by the end of this, hopefully. Um, so I won't get to the MongoDB side of things yet. We're gonna focus on actually um, building out our game first, and then and then we're gonna integrate the data side of things. Um, so I am using a more recent version of Unity. You don't need this one. You could use the long-term stable release, and you should be fine. Uh, but I've, I've, I'm always going bleeding edge on this. And I, I did uh, get this latest version with problems. So if, if you're looking for the latest, there probably will be problems um, with the Unity side of things, not necessarily the MongoDB side of things. For example, uh, my project was crashing when I tried to open it for the longest time. Uh, but let's go ahead and create a new project. I'm going to do a 2D project here. Um, I'm going to zoom in wherever I can. Certain sides of uh, pieces of Unity doesn't let me zoom in. Um, I'll try to relay the information on what I'm doing the best as possible. Uh, but I'm going to call this project uh, Tracy Devs Example. I'm going to save it uh, hopefully right on my desktop. And uh, let's create a new project here. It'll, it'll take a couple seconds to spin up. Let me see if I can bring up this chat here. Oh, you were posting uh, the previous links. Perfect. It'll take a minute or two to, to spin this project up. While that's spinning up, yeah, Nick, you've actually the, published so you, video games on yeah. the app stores and stuff using this before, haven't you? Yeah, I did about 10 years ago. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know if they're still on the App Store. I know that Apple and Google tend to purge a lot of things if you don't release an update now and then. Gotcha. Uh, a lot of things have changed since then. Uh, not so much on how you use Unity, but just uh, it's more performant and, and the little things that were previously kind of troublesome have been corrected. So they, the overall Unity experience, in my opinion, I don't have anything to compare it against really. But uh, it, it's a it's a very positive experience, especially I, I have no professional experience in game development. Uh, I come to Unity from a, a web development background, a little bit of mobile, a little bit of Java, not not a whole lot. Um, so if you're if you're looking to to create some kind of little games in your in your free time or even professionally, uh, Unity is very approachable, um, and it, it's pretty fun too the way that they've set it up. Cool. Thank you, sir. It's slow to create a new project, though. <laughs> this is the slowest part here of the entire night is is having it spin up a new project. Yeah. In my head, I would ask that question, and you would have answered it, and then it would have been done, and that would have been the time saver. But uh... And it figures that uh, it starts exploding on me as soon as I say that this version, it didn't explode on me for like the past three days, and then all of a sudden now it's, it's, uh, 
it's exploding, but we can get around this. I'm going to continue. It's going to send me in a safe mode. It's something with their package manager. It uh, spazzes out. I don't know if it's a Windows firewall rule issue or something, but for the life of me, I can't figure out how to fix it. Um, but um, luckily, you can just like destroy the packages as soon as it boots up in safe mode and life is good after. So you'll you'll see how to correct this problem in case you experience it yourself. It's just a it's just a band-aid fix though. It's not a not a big fix. So hopefully hopefully it makes it into the Unity safe mode though. Otherwise we're gonna have a wild night. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to enter into safe mode. Yeah, it's complaining about packages, so I'm going to go to help here. I'm going to reset packages to the defaults. And then it should at least allow us to get to where we need to be tonight. Hopefully. All right. Um, so we seem to be all right. Let me just hit this run button, see if it explodes on me. Shouldn't shouldn't show anything other than a blue screen here, which is which is great. Uh, so we're good. We're problem solved for now, I guess. Um, so this is what you would get when you open up Unity, at least the the most bleeding edge version of Unity. Um, you have a sample scene. You have a main camera. Our camera is in two D mode. Although in Unity, you never really leave 3D mode. You still have a Z axis at all times. It's just uh, positioned uh, to be 2D. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add a game object. Um, so everything in Unity is, is a game object. Um, and you can assign components to those game objects to make them into something particular. So you can have uh, assigned kind of sprite attributes to a game object. And there you go. You have a sprite. You can add... Uh, a music component to a game object. There you go. You have some background music or some sound effects. So everything is going to be a game object. Now I'm going to right click this project area uh, or what, what's in my scene. And I'm going to say uh, create. And I don't even see my 2D option. So that might be bad. Let me let me save it. If if this fails, though, I do have a backup plan. I'm gonna I'm gonna reboot this uh, and see if it, see if it works this time around. What should happen is I should see a menu item for for 2D type stuff, and I'm still. Let me create a new project here. I'm gonna try it again. I'm just gonna call it Tracy Devs. We'll see see if this works. The demo gods aren't on my side tonight. Also, worst case scenario is I could redial in with a laptop, a Mac, and uh, we can try that. But I do, with Zoom and everything, it does uh, slow down a little bit on the Mac, at least my, my Mac. That's why I'm trying to do it on the Windows. <laughs> yeah, it's probably going to time out again on this package manager, unfortunately. I think the joke's on me for, for using a bleeding edge version. The takeaway is never, ever upgrade. We should all be on Windows 98 yeah. still. Yeah. Oh, maybe it worked this time. Maybe, maybe Windows is giving me some nonsense with the hyphen in my path. You think that could be it? I mean, that was the, the issue. Would... 15 years ago, right? That wouldn't surprise me. Like, <laughs> I'm not going crazy Java here. Didn't, it didn't prompt me with an error with. Not that I remember it. Um, 
I've seen Java projects even within the last two years that had case sensitivity issues. So like, no, it would not surprise me in the least if the issue was a hyphen on your machine or in that path. Yeah. If it made it past the package manager stage, and I don't think it threw an error for this new project, then I think we're, we might be in good shape. Just still takes a long time though. And oddly enough, these Unity projects that it creates, they're like five gigabytes in size. It's like ridiculous. All right, no error this time. Let's, uh, oh, there we go. We have 2D object. We're golden. Something with hyphens on Windows, I guess. Maybe that was my problem all along. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new 2D object. Um, I could easily create a, 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 um, an empty game object and add these components manually. It's just a little quicker if I go uh, this route. I'm going to say sprites, and I'm going to say square. And I'm going to call this one player. And on the right in the inspector, really all it is is a game object with a sprite renderer component. That's all it added. And it used uh, one of Unity's kind of stock um, um, shapes for the actual image of the sprite. I could easily change that if I wanted to, uh, but I, I don't have any graphic assets lined up for tonight. It's just going to be squares and circles and stuff. Uh, it should, should serve its purpose. Um, what I'm going to do to this player to make it more uh, game ready is I'm going to add some more components to it. So I'm going to click the add button. Uh, we know that we will need collisions at some point in time, and this is a perfect square, so box collider 2D should work out fine. I'm also going to add another component. I'm going to say rigid body, um, and the rigid body is for our physics. Um, you will need um, physics in order to use collisions, um, so the two are, are, are required, although you don't need uh, colliders absolutely if you want to use a rigid body, but uh, you will need it the other way around. For the rigid body, uh, you'll notice that there are some body types. Dynamic would give it gravity. Uh, we don't need gravity for this example. We, we plan to move it uh, around on the screen, kind of Legend of Zelda NES style, um, where you can kind of walk anywhere. Um, so we want to make it kinematic. And we also want uh, the other um, body types other than dynamic to allow for collisions. Um, so I'm going to check this box. This sprite is good to go. I'm also going to add another sprite, so another game object. And it's going to be a, a square again. I'm going to add it. I'm going to call this one incentive. So this is could be a coin. It could be uh, something that you have to collect. Uh, and it's going to essentially give us points that we're going to store and work with and sync. Um, and it's going to it's going to set the set the set the tone here. To make it a little different, though, um, I am going to change the color of it. We'll make it green, for example. I'm also going to change the size of it, so I'm going to scale it down to half size. And I'm going to move it so that way it's just not right on top of my, um, my player. So it's a little bit off to the side. It, too, is also going to have a rigid body. It's going to not be dynamic. I don't need gravity. Uh, I'm going to say use the full contacts here. And I'm also going to say that this has a box collider. Uh, and the box collider stuff can be left alone because it's a perfect square. Um, if I if I needed to, if it was like some kind of funky object, I could I can edit the collider and kind of drag it in and make it more pixel perfect. But uh, these are easy colliders right here. Um, so if I saved it, I could run it. It won't do anything. Um, I'll just have two boxes on the screen. Um, so what we want to do is we want to be able to add controls to our player, so that way hopefully it can eat this this square or do something to it. Um, and accumulate our points. So I'm going to exit out of the run mode, and I'm going to go down and I'm going to click on my assets directory, which can be found uh, with my explorer as well. But I'm going to say create. I'm going to create a new folder, and I'm going to call this scripts. Now, you, you don't need to create folders. You could throw every asset you want into the root. It's just going to be a lot of chaos in the end. Um, inside the scripts directory, I'm going to say create. And I'm going to create a C-sharp script. And I'm going to call this one player. The naming convention does not matter. Um, so even though that uh, my game object is called player, my script does not need to be called player. Uh, but it is a good reference to know what, what exactly the script is going to be uh, working with. So I'm going to open it. 
and it's going to open up my Visual Studio Code, which I'm going to drag over. And I'll zoom in as well. Now, if you're just starting out with Unity, I do recommend that you use Visual Studio, the regular one, because you will get the IntelliSense and things like that. Um, it doesn't really play nice with Visual Studio Code, uh, IntelliSense and autocomplete and, and all that jazz, the auto importing of headers. Um, but that's totally up to you. If you want to live dangerously, use Visual Studio Code. Uh, is this? Can someone do a, a sizing check? Is this large enough? Is the font visible inside of here? Should I make it larger? I think it's fine. If someone else disagrees, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, Nick, your uh, your mic did start clipping a tiny bit when you're hitting some of the hard consonants. If you could like maybe turn the sensitivity down just a tiny hair, that might be helpful too. Yeah, let me let me reduce some sensitivity here. No, no, it's literally just like when you hit like you a hard it? P or a B or something, it'll I'll hear it clip a little bit. It's not a lot. It's all good. I, I reduced the gain by a decibel. Is that better? Can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. All right. Yeah, no worries. I am going to open up this player uh, C sharp script file. Um, and this is where we're going to start coding. How does the, pl the player behave? Um, so first of all, um, every script by default in Unity um, extends the mono behavior, which gives us to access to some of the Unity lifecycle events. So we have start and update by default. Start is when the first frame is rendered. Update is every frame after that. Um, there are other lifecycle events that we're going to use um, and some that we're going to get rid of. Um, so starting with, we're going to use the awake event. So awake happens before start. Um, and it's basically when this particular script uh, awakens for that first time. There's also an on enable and an on disable in case you need to use it more frequently. Uh, but inside of the awake, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be grabbing reference to any component that is attached to the game object that this script is also attached to. Um, so for example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say private, I'm going to say rigid body, and I'm going to say, uh, and I'm going to say this is a private variable. So I'm going to say rb2d maybe. And this is going to represent the rigid body that we attach to the player. And now we need to grab that off of the player. So what we can do is we can say rigid body 2D equals get component. And by default, it will get the component um, of whatever it's attached to. And this is going to be the type rigid body. So now we have access to the rigid body. So the rigid body is going to control um, things like the player location. Um, it can control the physics information. Now we could control the, the transformation information like the X and Y and Z of the game object without the rigid body. But since we have it, we, we can't just transform the um, game object because then the rigid body is going to be fixed in place and we're going to lose information um, that's important to us. So, so by having the rigid body, we have to make sure that the rigid body controls the game object from this point forward. A um, little, little confusing to make sense of it um, if you're first getting into it, but um, if you have a rigid body on, on, on one of your game objects, you should do all of your controlling through the rigid body. Um, all right, so we have that in the start. So on the first frame, it might make sense that we want to position the player at a certain fixed point. Um, so what I can do is I can say rigid body 2D and I can say position equals new vector two. So we're, we're in 2D space here, so we have an X and Y vector coordinate. Uh, if you were doing a 3D game, you would have a Z. Um, these are floating point values. So I can say that it's gonna be positioned at uh, zero and zero. So center of the gaming canvas. And this is at the first frame. Um, because we're working with physics, um, even though that we are not working with gravity, we should not be using the regular update. The, the regular update doesn't take into consideration um, any calculations or changes to whatever's happened with the physics engine. Um, you could do it in here, but it's, it's preferred per the Unity documentation that you do everything related to physics in a fixed update. So this, ha this, this uh, coordinates with whatever's happening with the physics engine. 
Uh, and this is where we're actually going to do our controlling of the, the game object. So every time we press a key on the keyboard, it should update the position. And this this fixed update is it's looping. It's for as long as it's active. So um, it'll happen more than once. So what we can do is we can say something like if input dot get uh, get key, and we can say key code, and maybe we say up arrow. There's other ways to handle input. You can use uh, controllers and stuff. Um, Unity has a ton of different ways to interact with, with user input. This is just one of many. Well, let's say that we, we get the up key uh, on our keyboard and uh, we wanna move the player up. So we can say RB2D, we can say position. We're gonna say plus equals. So we're gonna add to our current position. Uh, we could manually adjust the vector coordinate, but it's actually a lot easier just to say vector to dot up so it'll handle it for us it'll handle uh, a shift for us uh, we are going to want to multiply by um, the time step value so what we can do is time dot fixed uh, fixed delta time so that way it, it adds smoothing to our movement and we're also going to want to specify a speed at which our player moves um, so we could hard code that it's probably a good idea to to actually create a variable for that so that um, through the inspector. So what we can say is we can say serialize field. We can say private. Uh, this is gonna be a floating, floating point value. And we can say maybe movement speed. Let's default it to 5.0. Um, now, what exactly is the serialized field? So the serialized field um, will appear inside of the inspector. So you can edit, you can change this value directly within the Unity editor, whereas just a standard private variable uh, does not show up in the Unity inspector. Public variables also show up in the inspector, but we don't need them to be public. So let's keep them as private and serialize it. Um, we can multiply it. So we can multiply it by movement speed. So if I saved it and I went back into my Unity editor here and I ran it, wouldn't do anything because the script is currently sitting out in the in the void here. It's not attached to anything. So what I want to do is I want to click on player, I want to scroll down, and I want to drag the script over the add component. And now this script is attached to the player. The, the, uh, anything that it, that it does inside the update, the start, awake, is related to this particular player. I could add this script to 10 more game objects if I wanted to at the same time. It'll, it'll do the same thing on all of them. Um, so this particular one is not necessary, but if I were to create a script for, say, the incentive, and the incentive represented coins, I could scatter a bunch of coins around this, this screen, and that same script would control all of them. We can actually do that in a minute, too. Um, we'll keep the speed as 5, and uh, let's go ahead and hit that Run button and see what the up arrow does. I'm going to hit up, and it moved it up. Other arrow keys don't do anything at all. Um, you might notice that it is a little uh, little stuttery still. The Unity like preview area here, it's not as um, smooth as a final production build. So this could throw you off. It's thrown me off plenty of times where I think, oh, there's a problem with my game. It's, it's not running smooth. It's just not running smooth inside of, of the preview. If you build it, it's going to be like butter. So um, just keep that into consideration. Let's go ahead and add the rest of the uh, input keys. So I'm just going to copy this, and I'm going to paste it in. I don't, I don't like the, the formatting that C-sharp developers use, so I'm going to keep it uh, like every other programming language with the bracket on top. But we have um, a down arrow. Change that to down, and this should be an else if we have another else if and i'll just add another one because it'll represent each of the possible uh, keyboard motions here so this will be maybe left arrow and this will be right arrow and remember uh feel free to ask me questions too if you're if you're stuck if you're not sure why something is the way it is i'll stop it's fine uh we got we've got time tonight 
We have each of the, mo the motions here. So I'm going to go back into the Unity editor. It's going to refresh. I'm going to hit run. And uh, I'm going to move it around. I got full motion. And if I touch this, even though we have colliders on, it doesn't do anything. It'll just pass through. Now we got to come up with the logic um, for, for collisions. So I'm going to add another script. This one I'm going to say is the incentive script. I'm going to open it up in code. And we're going to do a lot of the similar stuff, but it, it will behave a little bit differently in the end. So, for example, we do want to get the rigid body. We do want to have um, an awake. And um, Unity doesn't, uh, there is no order of operations for each of the game objects in your scene. So the awakes, if you're expecting, like right now I have player on top of incentive inside of my scene. If you're expecting the awake method to trigger for the player prior to the incentive, it may, but it also might not. Um, so there there it doesn't it doesn't follow that strict order it only follows uh the order of the actual life cycle events for that particular script so get component oops so we have that this time around um so our incentive let's go ahead and and randomly place it on the screen when it starts up I know I dragged it to a specific location, but let's randomly place it. So I can do that by saying um, a rigid body. I can say position. It's going to expect a X and Y coordinate vector. So I'm going to say new vector two. Now I'm going to say random dot range, and I'm going to provide a range. So uh, usually, like at least for my for my screen. Uh, a value between negative four and positive four is usually pretty safe. But we can experiment with the bounds um, in just a minute if if we if we need to. So random uh, range. So this is x and y. These are floats. So when we start it up, uh, it'll randomly randomly be placed on the screen. Update we don't need. Um, we're not going to be uh, moving things around for the duration of. Um, the incentive being on the screen. It's just going to be a set it and forget it. But we do want it to do something when there's a collision. So we have the collision component set up. Uh, let's go ahead and move it if, if there is a co collision. So we're going to say uh, void on collision enter 2D. So this is a special Unity event because we do have the collider. Um, and there's like there's a on collision exit two D on collision um, stay I think it's stay two D something like that. Um, so if you're if you're interested in more like is the is the collision currently happening? Did it just happen? Did it just end? That kind of stuff. You have access to that information. So this is collision two D. If I wanted to, I can see what collided with this object. I don't care. There's only one player in this in this game. So if there is a collision, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to randomly reposition uh, this particular incentive. Um, and remember, this the incentive in question is the whatever this script is attached to. Um, so let's go ahead and attach it. As soon as it's done, I'm going to click on the incentive. I am going to drag incentive over. It's on. I am going to run it. It's randomly placed. I'm going to hit it. And uh, it's randomly repositioning every time I collide. Um, if I wanted to, I can add another incentive. Let's go ahead and add another incentive. I'm going to call it, um, this is going to be a square. Maybe I'll make this one red. It's going to, again, be a little smaller. I'm going to add a box collider. I'm going to add a rigid body. The order that I add these is not important. 
I'm gonna make this one not dynamic again. And I'm also going to add my incentive. I'm also going to rename this one uh, something else. Maybe I'll call it other incentive. Naming is not important. Uh, I am going to maybe move it just for the for my sanity's sake uh, for when it starts. But what should happen if this works correctly, both of these should be randomly positioned and behave independently of each other because the script is uh, sandboxed to each particular game object that it's attached to. So I'm going to run it. Now, because I didn't check to see what is colliding with which, if for some reason these reposition and they land on each other, they can they can collide with each other. Um, we can handle that scenario if it should happen. Um, so I hit that one, I hit that one. They're behaving independently of each other. So it's cool that you can repurpose uh, scripts in Unity. So if you've got like enemies in your game, you can create like a generic enemy script and it would it'd be Pretty, pretty good. You could also add more than one script to a game object. Um, so maybe you have a script that controls uh, weapons or uh, just the player itself or, or who knows. Whatever you can think up, um, you can attach it. All right, so before we get into the data side of things, so we're going to keep a score in just a minute. I'm going to add uh, one more thing to our scene. I'm going to add some text. So let me zoom out a bit too, so that way I can show it. Um, I'm going to right click again. I'm going to go down to the UI. Um, you're supposed to be using Text Mesh Pro, um, but I'm still using the legacy way to do text. Um, it's the Text Mesh, Mesh Pro is optimized, so it's you're going to get better performance and more features out of it. Um, but text is like dead simple to use in comparison. I mean, neither of them are particularly difficult, but this one's even easier in my opinion. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to maybe call this one score text. Doesn't really matter. Um, you'll notice that it's not anywhere on the screen here. It's because it's in the wrong um, uh, visual space. So I have to click on the canvas that it's a part of, and I have to change the screen space to be uh, relevant to the camera. And I need to specify the camera that I want to use. So I'm going to drag camera over to render camera. And now you'll probably see a little hint of it down in the corner. Um, it'll stay wherever the camera is positioned by doing this. Um, so what I can do is I can click on score text. Uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the default is going to be score. I'm going to maybe make it bold. I'm going to give it a size of maybe 18. I'm going to say that it's going to be vertically centered inside of the box. I'm going to give it a more, a better color to, so that way we can actually see it. Hexadecimal uh, white. And uh, I'm also going to change where its uh, pivot point is. So that way, should the screen happen to scale uh, or look different on different devices, it's going to be relative to the top left corner of the screen. Um, and it just, just works better in general if, if your pivot point is um, where you plan to position it. I'm going to put it there. Um, so that's where our score is going to show up eventually. Uh, and that's just text. Any questions up until now? Because we're gonna we're gonna pivot to a different a different section now. No, we're good so far. So far, so good. Don't, don't be shy if you got a question. Um, we're all we're all here. We're in this together to to be supportive here. Um, all right. So in Unity, by default, the only way to to work with any kind of data is to use uh, what's called a player preference. This is a key value store uh, type data utensil. Um, so you can you can store basically like a, a hash map, um, which works in a lot of scenarios, but you don't really have any query ability of it. You don't get to like easily sync it either. You, you, you provided a key, you get a value and end of story. Um, so it, like I said, it works, but you, you could do better, especially if your game becomes a little more complicated. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Window. I'm going to go to the Package Manager. And uh, for all I know, this could crash Unity again. I, I have no idea because we're having problems with the Package Manager tonight. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to click on the little cog icon inside of the Package Manager. 
uh, because this package is not in the asset store that Unity operates. You have to install it through other means. You're going to go to project settings. And oddly enough, um, Unity being C sharp and all, it does support uh, NPM packages, which is crazy. Uh, so we're actually going to get it from NPM. So let's go ahead and add a registry. This registry is going to be uh, the classic NPM registry. So registry dot npm uh what is the npm is it npm uh js right dot org i think so yeah i think that's right mm -hmm. and then the actual um sdk that we want to use or the actual uh repository that holds uh the Re mongodb realm sdk is what we're going to be using uh so it's io realm dot unity i'm going to save it and if nothing comes up, it's because I've got some, some part of this wrong. So I believe I hit apply. I'm going to close that. If I click on this packages area at the top that says in project, my registries should appear. Um, it won't be there out of the box. So just by seeing my registries means that we got it right because we added a new registry. So if I click it, Realm is going to show up now. And at that point, I can just say install. And it's going to add Realm to our project. So Realm, well, at least this version of Realm that we're installing right now is a local only Realm database. So it's going to sit on your mobile device or your computer or whatnot. Um, and it's going to be your local database. Uh, and it is a, so Realm is a little different than MongoDB. If you've ever worked with MongoDB, MongoDB being a document database. Realm is an object-oriented database, so it's storing stuff in the flavor of classes and things like that. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna bridge it together um, as we progress here. So it's installed. We're good. Uh, let's 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 go ahead and start using it. So the first thing that we've got to do when we use Realm is we have to we have to create a class because this is a, an object-oriented database. We gotta we gotta work with objects here. So if I go to the root level of my assets, it might make sense to create another directory. I'm going to call this one models for my data models, for my classes. I'm going to go into it. You don't have to follow my, my, my directory structure. You can create your own. Uh, I'm going to say create. I'm going to say C-sharp script. And I'm going to call this one player data. This is going to represent my player data. And I'm going to open it. So this is not going to be a mono behavior. This is, uh, so I'm going to wipe out some of these imports and I'm going to say using realms. Instead of extending mono behavior, I'm going to have it extend a realm object. And I no longer have mono behavior, so I can't use start and update anymore. It, it won't do anything. It'll just be regular methods. Um, but what I can do is I can start defining my uh, variables for this particular class. So my first variable, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I want to store the X and Y position inside of the database. So that way, when I launch it next time, I can pick up where I left off. So this is going to be a float. I'm trying real hard to keep things C-sharp uh, centric here by using capital letters uh, for variable names and underscores and, and all that stuff. Um, but you don't, have to, you don't have to follow anything that I do as far as um, your, your, your code styling. Um, I know coming from JavaScript or even Go, uh, which is what I do a lot of as well, um, the whole capitalization and underscore stuff uh, is weird to me. Is, that, is it weird to you at all, Nolan? I know you do a lot of JavaScript. Um, it's not, but that's because I, I'm fairly opinionated in my own way about stuff. <laughs> I, I generally don't worry about what the, um, if I'm working on a project by myself, I'll capitalize and format things however I want to capitalize and format things, which is not always what the trend is in that particular language. If I'm working on a team and they've got a code standard in place, I'll yeah. suck it up and follow whatever that standard yeah. is, you know, so that they don't yell at me. But yeah, um, you and I could probably, you know, have long, stupid, pointless discussions about where curly braces go and that sort of thing. And uh oh, are you <laughs> telling me they should go on the next line? I'm, I'm, I like the way they are right there in that file where your everything is vertically aligned. That's my. 
how about the other file where I did kind of a mix of both? Um, <laughs> that would that drive me crazy, right? No, that doesn't bother me either. Sorry, we're getting away. I, we could, I know. It's, um... it's all good. <laughs> um, I'm going to add getters and setters to each of these variables here. Um, so I'm going to say public float y. And we have a score that we plan to store. So that's just going to be an integer value. Um, and we do have a mandatory primary key field for Realm. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually make this an object ID. So if you're familiar with MongoDB, you can use object IDs, which are more or less hashes, which include the timestamp in them. Um, you could use strings if you want to, but you'll see where I'm going with this soon on why an object ID might make more sense. Uh, but it really doesn't matter. To use an object ID, though, you will need to add another import. So this is using uh, MongoDB dot bson so this is part of the bson uh, standard here and uh, this is going to be uh, public object id um, i'm going to call this one id it's going to have a get and a set as well it's also going to default to a value it's going to be object id and it's going to be uh, generate new id and you do have to explicitly uh, annotate this as a primary key inside of realm um, I mean it'll still it'll still work as a normal class but it uh, you won't be able to do realm things with it unless you unless you do that so we have we have our first kind of draft of this of this data model it's going to change um, a little bit as well let's add one more item let's go ahead and add a user ID so that way in case uh, when we start doing sync and stuff like that at least it's ready to go um, but I'm gonna say public I'm gonna call this one a, a string Maybe user ID, get and set is fine for us for now at least. So we have that. Let it let it reload. It always reloads every time you go back to the editor, and it'll it'll start printing out red lines of of errors if I if I have some kind of typo, which I fully expect at some point in time there will be some typos. Um, I can go back to the root. I'm going to go into my scripts directly directory. I'm going to create another script. I'm going to call this one Realm Controller. Um, so the goal here, at least for this example, is we're going to have a singleton instance to our local database. You don't need to do it this way, especially in this example tonight, since we're only going to ever have one scene. Um, the reason why I'm doing a singleton instance um, to show you how you could and why maybe you should is if I had multiple scenes and I needed to bounce between them, well, I'm going to lose my connection to my database, which is not totally important uh, when you're working offline. But when you start working online and you need to and you need to do sync, well, you need to you need to log in to that database. So by changing scenes, if you're if you're adding it to say a, a, like a game controller that exists only in that scene, well, you're going to have to reestablish that connection to your database every time, uh, which is going to slow things down. It's going to cause you some drama, but if you have one singleton instance that kind of gets fired off at the very beginning of your of your game, well, you can re reuse that database wherever you end up. So it makes it pretty convenient. Um, I'm going to open it. I don't think I opened it. There we go. Um, I'm going to say using realms. Uh, this is going to be a mono behavior. We're going to keep it as as that. I'm gonna, we're not going to use the start. There's no frame rendering for this particular controller it's its sole purpose is to control things not uh, render things but uh, we will have an awake um, and we will have an on disable but before we get there let's go ahead and set up our singleton instance here so we're going to say realm controller and we're going to say instance and this is going to be a static variable so i'm going to say public static Inside of the awake, when things finally come up, um, we're going to say that uh, if instance equals null, we're going to set it. Otherwise, um, we're going to use whatever instance already exists. And to start things off, we're going to say don't destroy on load. Um, so basically, when we switch scenes, it's not going to recreate itself. It's going to use whatever one was initially created. Um, and this is important because if we're 
destroying this singleton every every time we switch scenes we're we're back at square one we're going to have to re reestablish any connections later on and i'm going to specify game object which is a, a reserved uh variable here uh, which represents whatever game object this script is attached to we're going to say instance equals this so it's going to be whatever this class is um, and then we're going to specify um, the database that we want to use. So uh, let's go ahead and create a variable for that. This can be private. And uh, we're going to say realm. And we're going to say realm equals realm.getInstance. And remember, we're, this is, we're working strictly offline right now. Uh, we're going to worry about the online stuff later. Uh, but this will get an instance to our local realm database. All right. Let's uh, let's press on here. So we have a wake. Let's let's do the on disable stuff. So void on disable, which is going to be valuable for when we stop our game. We want to properly shut down our database. Um, so what we can say is we can say if realm not equal to null, then we can say realm dot dispose. And this will clear things up so that way if we restart our game, we don't potentially run into issues because the database is properly not properly closed. So we have those. So this is the only lifecycle events that we're going to use for this particular class. What we also want to do, though, is we want, since we're going to use a singleton here, uh, and rather than passing around Realm uh, or having it public to be accessed wherever we are, let's just add our methods directly to this Realm controller, and we can do a, a very function style approach to, to using our data. So for example, I'm going to say, um, not void, I'm going to say uh, public player data. Um, so this is our player data model is what's going to be returned. And I'm going to say get or create player data. So by default, it's not going to exist. So we want to get it or create it. So that way we can use it at the next stage. So we can do something like uh, player data um, player data equals, and we can say realm. And this is where we start querying. So we can say find, and find will allow us to find based on the primary key. So if I happen to miraculously know my my object ID that was created, I can pass this in and it'll it'll find it for me, that that one single document. Or I can say all. And by saying all, I get to use a uh, link with C-sharp to actually query my database for documents. So I'm going to say player data. Um, and this is where I can use link. But I, I haven't imported link. So if I go to the top, I can say using, I can say system.link. This is a feature of, of .NET C-sharp. Uh, it lets you write uh, queries fairly easily using a, a, a function syntax or a um, I don't know the name of the other syntax, but it's more like SQLy, if you like SQL. Um, I don't know if somebody else on the on the Zoom knows the exact terminology of it, but we're going to use the function approach. Um, so I'm going to say where, and I'm going to say player, and oops, I'm going to say uh, player dot user ID, and I'm just going to say that the the user ID has to equal this and reboy value for now. And I'm also going to say that I'm going to get the first result in case, because user ID is not, not unique. Um, I'm going to get the first result. And if that first result doesn't exist, I'm going to use the default value, the default value being null, um, which will allow us for our, our next step. Um, so we're either going to get a document or um, like a, a, an object in this case, or we're going to get a null value. So we're going to say player data. We're going to say if player data equals null, then we have to create this data. Otherwise, in the end, we're going to have data, so we're going to return it. So we're going to return player data. So if it's null. So with Realm, you can access each field from your class um, like you would any other class in C Sharp. When it comes to writing, to make sure that there's no problems. Um, you do have to use a special write block so that way um, you're not 
fighting resources and things like that. It's there's a special way to do it. Um, but to do that, you would just say realm dot write, and you would add whatever whatever actual changes you want to make inside of this block, and it's safe to do so. So you can you can read from your from your objects like you would any other class, uh, but to write you have to do inside of this inside of this block if you want it to be realm friendly. Um, and we know that we don't have um, an object at this point in time, so we can say something like player data equals. We can say realm dot add. So we're going to add something to our realm. We're going to add this new object. Um, we're going to, what do we have? We have a, a user ID. So the user ID is going to be Enra boy. We have an X value, which is going to be zero. We have a Y value. We can say zero and we have a score, which we're also going to say zero. Uh, so this is going to be our default object that we add to realm. And you don't have to do it this way. This is just the way that I like to do it, um, with this method and, and making sure that it exists prior. There's a bunch of other ways that you can do it too, but this is my my preference. So at least when we know when we call this, we have some data. Let's go ahead and add some more methods here. Uh, let's go ahead and say that we want to update that position. So we can say public. We can say uh, we don't we don't need to know if the if the update happened or not. We can just say void, and we can say update position. Uh, we can provide it a vector. So we can say vector two. And we can say maybe position. We're going to say player data equals, and we're going to say get or create player data. So we're always going to be sure that our data exists. And for this example, because we're playing our own game, where we're going to be a player of our own game, we should only have one object that we're using in this game. Uh, this could be um, a unique value, it could be whatever, but we should only ever have one value. Um, now, if you have a more complicated game, you might have more values, you may have other realms, you can have different, it doesn't have to be just one player data type object inside of your database, it could be tons of different um, objects. But for this, it's, it's simplistic. So we have our player data. Uh, we want to update the position, we can say realm.write. And we can say um, player data dot x equals position dot x and player data dot y equals position dot y. And that's uh, actually a lowercase y. Um, and we're done. We, we can update the position, position in realm like this and it, it would save it for us. Let's do another one. Let's, uh, I'll just copy this. And let's say that this is going to be um, increased score. We're just we're just laying the foundation right now. It's going to get a little more exciting in a minute. Let's say that we want it to be an integer value because maybe we don't want to increase it by one. Maybe maybe we have certain uh, incentives that are worth more than one point. Um, so we have a value, and this time around we have score plus equals value. So we're increasing it. Let's say that we want to have uh, a few more uh, methods here. Let's say that we want to um, return a position. I'm going to paste this down. I'm going to say maybe get position. Uh, this will return a vector two. We, we really don't need that, but we can say return. Uh, we can say player data dot uh, we want to say return new vector two, and we don't we don't need this method. We don't need any of these methods if we don't want. But we're going to say uh, player data dot x and player data dot y, and we're just we're just doing this because it makes it a little easier because we know we're going to be working with vectors when the time comes. Um, so might as well return that value. Hey Nick, you it. also need to update the uh, return type on that method, don't you? On line 58, where it says public void, shouldn't that be public vector 2D? Yeah, actually, you're right. All right. Yeah. There we go. Good catch. That would have we would have we would have ended back here eventually, but you just saved us some time. 
Uh, so we have get position. Um, I mean, we can do a get score if we wanted to. I think I think this is a good uh, point to start testing and, and including it in our in our actual game. Uh, so if I go back into Unity, uh, it's going to reload for a second. I'm going to create another game object. This one's going to be empty. Doesn't need any class uh, components attached to it. I'm going to call this one Realm Controller just for naming purposes. And uh, I'm going to say that I want to drag Realm Controller onto it. So it's going to control that. Now, if I go back into the player, I go back into the player, and uh, we can add another on collision in here. So on, uh, so void on collision enter 2D. Um, remember, um, just because we're doing something with the collision for the incentive doesn't mean that uh, we're doing anything with the player. So each script is, again, sandboxed to whatever it's attached to. So now we're going to do something if to the player if, if that collision happened. Uh, so we're going to say um, realm controller being a, our static uh, our static uh, singleton here. So we're going to say instance. And we're going to say um, update position. So we'll only update the position when there was a collision. I mean, you could do it every time you hit a key if you wanted to. It's really up to you. You could even do it like on a throttle, like uh, every three seconds or something. But when we collide, that's fine for us for this example. And I'm just going to say um, the R, uh, a rigid body dot position, which is a vector two. So it's going to update it. I'm also going to say realm controller. I'm going to say instance. And I'm going to say increase score. I'm just going to increase it by one. And um, what we can also do um, is we can change this. So the start. So we can pick up where we left off when we restart the game. So we can actually say, um, I think we, we return a vector. So we can actually say, uh, realm controller dot instance dot get position. So it'll just start wherever we picked up. Uh, and by default, it's going to create a new object for us at zero, zero, which is fine. Uh, we should be good. Uh, there is another thing that we want to do, though. So if I go back into um, our editor, we don't have anything controlling the score. I mean, we have score text, but we don't actually have anything updating it or present. I mean, we're storing it, but we're not presenting it in any fashion. We're not updating the text. Um, so it might be a good idea to add another game object. I'm going to call this one game controller. So this one's uh, responsible for, in this, in this example, in theory, controlling just this particular scene. Uh, we're not going to, we're not going to keep it between scenes. We're just going to keep it for this particular scene. Uh, we could usually call it scene controller as well. Well, let's go ahead and add another script. I'm going to call it game controller. Uh, we will be working with text, so I do need to do an import here. And uh, let's go ahead and set up our variable for this. This is going to be a serialized field, so that way we can access it from the um, inspector. It's going to be private text, and I'm going to call this one um, score text, something similar to, the, to what it's called in the in the scene. Um, in the, I don't need to do the await uh, because we're going to be doing something a little different here. But when we start things off, uh, we can say something like, uh, what do we have? Score text dot text. So we're going to set it. We're going to set it to score. And we're going to say realm controller dot instance. And I didn't create a method for getting the score. So what I can just do is I can say get or create player data, which is going to get us whatever player data exists. And I can just say uh, score. So access the field directly that way. And uh, after that first frame, let's go ahead and, and update it every other frame, the score. I'm going to go back into my uh, Unity editor. We're going to attach the script. So 
So I'm going to click on the game controller. I'm going to drag the game controller over this add component. You can see that I have score text because it's a serialized field. So I'm going to drag score text, which is of type text, on top of it. And now the game controller can control that particular piece of text. Um, I'm going to save it. And I am going to run it and see if things blow up. All right, we're starting at zero because we have not previously saved a position. Uh, I'm going to hit this. The score increased. I'm going to hit that. Uh, score increased again. I'm no longer centered, so I'm going to stop it. I'm going to run it again. Hopefully it still has, what do we leave it at, two or three of the score, plus uh, a certain position as well. Yeah, so the position's down there. The score is still good. Um, so that, that data is now stored locally. Um, it may seem like a lot of work uh, compared to player prefs. Player prefs is dead simple if you just need a key value store. But like, like we saw inside of in this uh, realm controller right here, the moment you start needing to, to query stuff, player prefs is out the window. Um, you, you'll, you're going to need to switch to SQLite or, in this case, Realm. Um, and Realm is, is pretty easy for an object, um, object-oriented database, and it becomes more valuable when you start to need to sync stuff, uh, which we're going to do now. How long is this meetup scheduled for? Do I have time? Because I, it's going to take about 30 minutes to do sync. Um, you can keep going if you want. Yeah, it's... They're usually roughly an hour, but we started a few minutes late, and there's no hard stop. Zoom's not going to kick us off or anything. So if you want to perfect, yeah, um, tear through and do more stuff, go for it. The, the sync stuff is pretty cool because um, it takes a lot of work out of the, the equation and um, do some pretty nifty things, which I'll show a demo of um, towards the end of something I worked on last year for AWS reInvent. Um, so that was pretty cool. So what I want to do, I want to do a few things here. Uh, first of all, I want to go to my web browser. I want to go back into MongoDB. This is MongoDB Atlas. So this is the cloud-hosted uh, version of MongoDB. I am using an M0 size cluster. This is the free tier cluster. Everything that I do tonight works on the free tier, and you don't even need to enter your credit card to use it. Um, but we will be using Atlas, not, not the open source version of MongoDB. Um, so what I can do is I can go to the root side of Atlas. I already have a cluster deployed, like I said. Um, and uh, I just saw a text coming in from Bill. Uh, thanks for coming in, Bill. Maybe I'll see you next time. Um, I'm going to click on Browse Collections. I do have uh, databases here already. I'm going to create a new database. I'm going to call this one Tracy Devs. The name of the database is not too important. What is important is the collection name. The collection name needs to match your class name uh, if you want to do uh, sync in this case. So, and you could always change your class name up uh, and you could also change it up in the next step as well. But it's just easier if, if everything's named the same, especially since we're starting from, uh, from fresh here. Um, so I might call it player data and I'm going to create. Now, because we're going to be using sync, we can't depend strictly on MongoDB Atlas. We do need to specify a schema in the app services section of the MongoDB cloud. Um, now, there are various ways to specify the schema. You could enter it manually, um, which is more or less uh, a variation of what we defined in our player data class. Uh, we can have it consume uh, when, we, when we try to sync that first time. It'll, it'll make an attempt to create a schema for us. Or uh, my preferred method, which I've had the most success with, is just throw some dummy data into this collection and have it generate based on the fields that you have. Um, there's other ways too, but um, it's really whatever your preference is. And I, I personally like this way better. Um, so we'll insert a new document into this collection. Is this, is this large enough, Nolan? I didn't ask. Um, I, th I think so. All right. If, if it becomes a problem, let me know. Okay. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be adding each of the fields that we have in our uh, class, and they don't need to be named the same. They can be, but they don't need to be. And I'm going to I'm going to specifically name them something else so we can see um, how that works. So I'm going to call this one user underscore ID, all lowercase. Um, it 
the, the case sensitivity does matter here. Um, I'm just going to enter some randomness here. We have an X, which uh, I'll do lowercase as well. It's a string, but I'll, 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 re I'll change it in just a moment. Uh, we have uh, zero and we have a score, uh, which is zero. The score is going to be an integer. And uh, we don't have float in the option list here, so I'm going to use double. Uh, so we have an object ID, a string, a double, a double, and an int, which should match our um, class that we created in Unity. So I'll insert it, which uh, we can see right here. Now what I can do is I can go to the app services. I can create a new app. You can see I have several apps. They all do different things. Um, you can create, I think, as many as you as you want on the free tier. Uh, it's mostly the free tier expires when you start doing too many requests. Um, and then it's like pay as you go. Uh, but everything I do tonight works fine. I've, I've done more complicated apps um, on the free tier too that have hit like hundreds of thousands of, of hits and it's still been free. Um, but let's go ahead and create a new app. There we go. Zoom in a bit. I'm going to call this Tracy Devs. I'm just going to call it Tracy Devs Example. We're going to use our examples uh, cluster. I'm going to create a new app. So this used to be called Realm, uh, Realm on like Realm Cloud Services, uh, and it even used to be called Stitch at one point in time. Um, but now we're calling it App Services. Uh, it does more than just sync. I mean, you get uh, you got GraphQL support. So if you if you didn't want to write your own GraphQL API, uh, you could just do a few clicks and, and transform any one of your collections into an API just right there out of the box. Um, you can do like serverless functions, kind of like Lambda, um, static website hosting, a whole, whole lot of different things that you can do out of here. But we're going to focus on Tefai Sync. But before we even get there, uh, we need to first create a schema. We want uh, player data from our list. Um, this is where that schema dev mode is that I was talking about. It's kind of new. I'm just going to old school. I'm going to say generate a schema. It's going to look at the documents that I have in my collection and, and make sense of it. I only have one document, so the sample size doesn't really matter. But I'm going to generate. It's going to do a pretty good job at generating that schema. Uh, it, it followed it exactly to, to what I have in, in, in Atlas. But I know that uh, my X and Y values are float values. So this is where I can specify. I could have used double if I wanted to, but I'm, I chose to use float because that's what Unity likes. Um, and the int is fine. The object ID is fine. It, it didn't title it correctly. And this is where if you didn't want it to really match the collection exactly, uh, you can actually give it a different title. Um, but I do want it to match. So I renamed the title player data. I also want to specify that certain fields are uh, required. Some of them can be optional if you want, but it. I, I usually get best results if I define uh, rigid schemas. I think most people do. If they if they define rigid schemas, they get better results. But I'm going to specify that the ID is required, the user ID is required, the X, the Y, and the score. And these are these are variables as defined in, in Atlas, not in my class. I'm going to save it. Perfect. It's going to ask me if I want to review it and deploy it. Um, I'm going to say deploy. And you can disable that so that way it doesn't ask you every time too. Uh, so that's successful. I do need to enable authentication. Uh, by default, there's no authentication, so you can't you can't use sync. Uh, for, simpl uh, for simplicity, we're not going to worry about it. some of these fancy ones. Apple's already in there as well, and that's like just been recently announced. Uh, I think it's that Apple. It could be their Apple single sign-on. It's one of those. Uh, we're going to worry about anonymous. And anonymous authentication, really all it does is you tell it you want to log in. It creates a unique session for you. That session exists in your local database uh, for as long as that database exists. And end of story. There's no need to enter, like register, things like that. So I'm going to enable it. None of the authentication providers are particularly difficult to set up inside of Unity or outside of Unity. Um, but 
this uh, this is only a single line of code really that we have to add to our to our app to make this work. So I figured it makes the most sense for us tonight. So we have authentication, perfect. Uh, final thing is we need to enable device syncing. And this is the same device syncing that you would set up if you wanted to sync like regular Swift applications or Kotlin applications, things like that. Um, so it works for Unity as well. So I'm gonna say start syncing. You could do sync based on uh, partition key value and where that might be valuable is maybe you wanna sync like every document on in California to California people or whatnot. You provided a field and it'll partition your data like that and it'll sync only that data versus flexible is uh, more query based. So you, you get more, more power out of that, but partition is fine for us. We're going to, we're going to disable the dev mode. We're going to leave that off. We're going to specify the cluster we want to use, which is examples. We want to specify the partition key. And you'll notice that it's not asking us like what collection or what database we want to use. If there is a schema defined for any one of your collections and you have a partition key that's represented in those, it's going to be included in sync. Um, so you don't have to worry about specifying if you don't want to. It's going to create an index for us. We can define some permissions. In this case, I'm going to say, you know what? If I'm not the owner of this particular document, I shouldn't be able to see it or edit it. And that's where the uh, the session information comes in from the anonymous login or the username and password login. So I'm going to choose that. And it's going to set that part partition as the user ID. Advanced, we don't need to worry about it. I'm just going to enable the sync. It's going to have me uh, confirm it up here because I still have development mode or draft mode enabled. All right, from a remote perspective, we're set up with MongoDB to use sync. We do have to make a few changes in our game for that to be possible, but they're, they're fairly minor changes. So I'm going to go into um, our code. We're going to start our changes with the actual data model. So remember, my fields in, in MongoDB Atlas are different than what I have in this class. So we need to define a proper mapping of those. And even before we do that, we need to um, actually, yeah, we don't we, we don't need to add that here. We'll add it in a different file. Uh, I was, there's going to be another import that we have to use for sync, but we're not actually using sync yet in this file. Uh, what we are doing is we're defining, uh, like I said, the uh, map. So for example, ID is not, it doesn't look like this in the database. So I'm going to add an annotation called map to, and this particular field maps to underscore ID. Or this one is going to map to user underscore ID. And same thing for all of them. Um, what do I, this is just X. And I'm going to show you another tip uh, if you don't want to type all this too. And we have map to. And this is score. Now, uh, the partition key does need a special annotation here. You need to put required. Um, if you didn't want to type all this in, uh, you should be able to go to your web browser. You should be able to go to the Realm SDKs. And it'll actually give you the object models for you based on how you have it set up. So this is exactly what I typed in. It just saves you an extra step. Uh, although the object ID didn't default it to a to a value, so almost there, ninety nine percent of the way there. Um, all right, so that's configured. Our our, uh, our data model is, is set up for sync, but we need to worry about our Realm controller because we need to worry about actually authenticating, so that way sync is possible. So we're going to make a few minor adjustments here. We're gonna add a few more variables. So first of all, let me import it. I'm gonna say using um, realms.sync. This is going to be private app, which is part of realms.sync. So I'm gonna say realm app. Um, this is going to be user. And I need one more. 
Um, so I'm going to say this is serialize field. This is going to be private. This is going to be um, string. This is going to be realm app ID. And we'll even get a default value for it. Now, this ID is kind of what links your sync to any particular MongoDB application. And it's right up here. So every time you create a new application, you can copy that app ID. And you can go back into your code, paste that sucker in. It's not sensitive. It can be exposed. It's fine. Um, I'm going to save it. Um, so we have part of the foundation in. We need to change how we get the instance now. So we need to authenticate before we try to get an instance to our database. So let's actually comment that out. And what I can say is I can say something along the lines of realm app equals um, app.create. I'm going to pass in that realm uh, app ID. And I'm going to check. Well, first of all, I'm going to do an exception handle because we're, we're making re we're making remote requests here. So we should probably catch our, our exceptions at this point or our problems. I'm going to say exception. You do unfortunately need to import something. So I'm going to say import system. So that way I can work with exceptions. I'm going to say debug.log, log error actually. And for all you JavaScript developers out there, this will look familiar. Uh, we actually need to make this uh, async await. So I'm going to say async uh, void awake. And uh, it, in JavaScript, they you're, you're supposed to wrap it in a try catch uh, if you don't want to use a, just the promise notation. But what we want to do is, well, uh, first let's let's see if we already have a session established. Uh, I mean, we're not logging in. We, we're technically not going to log out either. Uh, because this is anonymous auth, it's it's kind of isolated to ourselves here. Uh, I'm going to say if I'm going to say realm app dot current user equals null. So if it's null, we're we're not currently logged in. Else, uh, we're going to use whatever we have that's currently logged in. So I'm going to say realm user equals realm app dot current user, and I'm also going to get the instance now. So I'm going to say um, realm equals, um, what, what is it? Realm dot um, get instance. And I'm going to specify uh, a configuration for sync. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to look pretty much the same, except for instead of just a regular instance, it's going to be a specialized sync instance. Um, so I'm going to specify a new partition sync configuration. I'm going to specify the partition key, which we've specified as the user ID. So I'm going to say realm user dot ID. So when you authenticate to MongoDB or the app services, you're given a ID, which can be used as a user ID if you want it to be. Um, you're also going to specify the realm user that is going to be um, authorizing this, this sync. So I'm going to say just realm user, just like that. Um, if you weren't using the ID or you wanted to hard code something, you, you could, uh, you don't have to do it that way, but it makes sense because we're only going to, our partition key is whatever document we're a user of. Um, and that's going to be synced down to us. Even if it wasn't, even if we were, even if we were syncing based on a more generic key, because we set that rule that said that we have to be the owner of our, of our document, we still wouldn't be able to see it or, or edit it. Uh, it's just. We're, we're saving ourselves from syncing more than we have to here. So that's if the user is currently logged in. If it's not currently logged in, um, not too much different here. Um, so what we can actually say is uh, we can say realm user equals await. So this is where we do our kind of async uh, remote auth. But we're going to say, um, what are we going to say? We're going to say, realm app dot um, log in async, I think. If it errors out, we'll, we'll try something else. Uh, log in async, and then we're going to specify what type of uh, login we want to do. Um, so in this case, we're going to use anonymous. Uh, if we wanted to say, for example, use email password, we would say credentials dot email password and provide a, an email address and a password. 
Uh, but in that circumstance, we would actually have to do a registration command first, which is just a single line, but it's an extra step. So we do a login async. We're waiting for that to complete. Um, and then we're going to do realm equals realm dot get instance async. And this, uh, this should be an await too. And the reason why we're doing an async version this time is because it potentially has to start downloading some stuff from the cloud. Um, and um, we want to make sure that there's no like blocking going on or anything like that. Um, so that way it can progress into your application while it's still syncing in case there's a lot of information to sync. Um, but we're going to copy this. And there are other ways to do it too. So there are actual commands that say, you know what, don't like block until everything has downloaded or block until everything has uploaded. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so in theory, right now we're, we're authenticated and we have a syncable realm instance, but we have to make some adjustments. Like for example, we're no longer using Enroboy. We're using whatever realm user ID is. So let's go ahead and change that. Uh, so I have it in two places. I'm doing a, a bulk change here. I'm going to say realm user dot ID. And I can easily pass something too, but uh, we're just going to we're going to leave it like that. So if it doesn't exist, it's going to create a new document or a new object with um, our user ID being whatever realm specifies. And it's not it's not sensitive information. It's not an access token or anything. So I'm going to save that. There is uh, one more um, potential drama that uh, we're going to face here. So we're going to face, in this current state, a race condition because uh, we don't have an actual login scene. We don't have anything that says login and then navigate to the next scene after login has completed. So what's going to happen is uh, we're potentially going to try to use a, um, a Realm instance that hasn't been opened yet because it's still in the process. Um, so we can cheat a little bit. Um, so what I can do is I can say something like uh, create another method here, public. I'm going to say Boolean. I'm going to say is Realm ready. If you had another scene, uh, this would be easier, but we're not going to create a, another scene tonight. But I'm going to say return. I'm going to do a ternary operator here. I'm going to say something like Realm. So if that's uh, true, then return true. And I, there's probably a different way to do this. I I'm not, I'm not as crafty with my statements. It's just going to be true or false. So we're going to make a few adjustments in order to accommodate is realm ready because it will start throwing errors at us. So for example, uh, if I go to game controller, well, this is going to explode because it may try to access it quicker than it's available. Um, so easy fix if realm controller dot instance dot is realm ready then we can go ahead and use it and we're pretty much done at this point after after we fix this and we get some pretty fancy sync going on i'll just i'll just leave the bracket weirdness alone so we have that if i go into player uh this probably won't be ready either so let's go ahead and accommodate I think that's everything that happens up front. The collision stuff, we don't have to worry about because by the time we hit something, Realm should be good. Uh, if, if not, we can we can revi revisit. I think we're good to test at this point. Uh, one thing that we should do, because we started off with uh, like a, just a local only, and our, our schema has changed and we didn't do proper upgrades uh, here. I'm just going to blow out that that old database. So I'm going to go on Windows, at least it's in the app data, local low. I didn't give my um, Unity app a, a company. It's just default company. And I'm just going to waste all these right here and it'll recreate them. Uh, but if you wanted to do the proper migration steps because our schema changed, that's on you. It's just easier because we're starting fresh to just wipe it out. Um, Let's run it and see if we get any errors. We do have errors. Uh, did I misspell this? I uh, cannot convert. Let's see what we got here.
Ah, that's supposed to be a method. Got it. All right, let's try it again. And it caught the errors before I hit run, which is nice. It'll, we'll get other errors if we if we run. <laughs> but at least uh, this should work out fine. All right, so I am going to hit run. Let's actually make sure that the realm controller has our value. It does. So let's hit run. Fingers crossed. We had a bumpy start at the beginning. All right, so we're centered because we have no data. It's zero. Um, it says that we're connected and everything's fine and cool. Uh, let's go ahead and start hitting some objects. Looks good. I'm going to leave it running, actually. I'm going to go back to the web browser. I'm going to go to Atlas here. I'm going to click Browse Collections. Got my player data. I've got that one random document in there that I created up front, but I do have a document with some position information and a score. And if I wanted to, I can just edit it right here. Maybe, maybe I make this a 40 and I'm going to click update and I'm going to go back into Unity. Bam, it's, it's, it's synced. It's, it's quite fast. It's pretty cool. Um, so if you were to have to like program this stuff on your own, like the sync stuff, it'd kind of be a pain in the butt um, because you have to worry about all the edge cases and, and collisions and things like that. But it's, it's pretty neat. Um, to just do that in Realm, especially with the free tier. That's kind of where I wanted to take this. I, 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 I'll show a demo that I did for, for the Amazon conference. Let me see if I can bring it up. I don't remember what I called it. Let's, uh, let's check it out. Uh, something to reinvent. All right, um, so I did this for the Amazon conference. Um, it's a full-fledged game, but let's see if I download it. I think my I think my clusters are still up for this for this game. I have some uh, binaries up here in case you wanted to try it yourself. Um, it might take. I don't know on my internet so slow today too. This could be part of my problems tonight. If it doesn't load, I'll go back to the, um, the little GIF I made. Uh, it's basically just a uh, like Legend of Zelda type move around the game. You get mini games. Uh, you get uh, it, it syncs score. There's a leaderboard associated to it. Let's see if the leaderboard is still up. So the conference was a little bit a little bit ago. It wasn't recently. Uh, the leaderboard is still there. Um, yeah. So people were playing it at one point in time. Basically, what happens with this leaderboard is as you're playing, uh, there's also a web SDK for Realm. And uh, you can get all of those changes that happen. So every time somebody's score changes, it starts playing fireworks and it, and it switches them on the leaderboard. It, it was pretty cool. Um, but it's just cool stuff you can do with Realm. And the code is here in case you wanted to look at it. I think that's all on my end. I mean, did I lose anyone? Is there, is there any questions? I know that we covered a lot. I had one question for you, Nick. Um... First of all, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, and my question is, um, in the first um, realm demo you did, it was uh, saving local only. And then you switched yeah. and we did the authorization where it, it um, saved it to the cloud system. Yeah. If you're, say we leave the code as is, where it's it's pushing it up to Atlas. If, they're, um, if Atlas is unreachable for some reason, my Wi-Fi goes down, will yeah. it fall back to a local database without me having to change any code? Yeah, good question. So you're always only ever commuting with your communicating with your local database. The sync happens on a separate process. Uh, um, so if the connection goes down, uh, you're still working with it locally. You won't be able to, I guess, authenticate. Um, but if you've already authenticated in the past, um, as long as your code permits it, I mean, you could always say don't don't permit this unless you have a connection kind of thing. But as long as your code permits it, it's always going to uh, read and write from the local and uh, sync whenever possible. Got it. Cool. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good question, though. I know that wasn't too exciting. We've only worked with squares in this one, but the, the goal was not to make anything pretty. 
for tonight? I thought it was great. It's real easy to tell this way too, with you know what the squares represent without getting lost among you know picking icon sets or anything like that. Yeah. It's like, all right, here's my good guy. Here's my incentives, uh, and then we can focus on the bits elsewhere that we're supposed to focus on. Absolutely. Does anyone else have questions for Nick? And this does work mobile. So, I mean, uh, the SDK, if you, I mean, Unity makes it pretty easy to uh, build for different platforms. I mean, I, I don't have a license for PlayStation 5. I don't have a developer kit for those. So it'd be cool, though. But you, it would work for, for all of them. You can build this game. You would change your input controls slightly to use the more generic controllers. But Sync would still work. We're, 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 it would work great. We had not a question, but a comment in the chat. Uh, just Linda just said, thank you. That was great. And she has oh, to take yeah, off, perfect. but she wanted to thank you for doing the walkthrough. Yeah, no problem, Linda. Thanks for coming by. So what are you building next, Nick? Are you, allowed, or are you allowed to talk about it? For a game? Or, yeah, sure. Or just with this realm uh, tech in general, if it's not a game. Yeah, well, I'm actually trying to trying to um, work on Unreal, Unreal Engine. Nice. Um, so I don't know any Unreal Engine, but um, I went to GDC uh, recently. It's probably I, I did get sick there, uh -huh. <laughs> but it was the most recent conference I went to, and uh, the demand for Unreal is enormous. Like if you're an Unreal developer. You're you're in hot demand right now for, is in the gaming industry more so than Unity, um, even though I I find Unity pretty easy because it's C sharp not C plus plus like Unreal is but people are doing some, some cool stuff. There's a C sharp there, there's a C plus uh, plus SDK so I would I would connect the dots. Gotcha. It's been a long time since I was at the game developer conference, but that is a really fun event to go to. It is sure. very. Um, any other questions? Stop sharing my screen. Going once, going twice. All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you again very much, Dick. That was great.